Now, if we've got paths that have a lot of reversals in time, then it'll expose the difference between the forward Hamiltonian and the backward Hamiltonian. If we've only got, um, if we've got no reversals in time, so if you've got a path just in one direction, we'll only see one Hamiltonian. If it's in the opposite direction, we'll see the other Hamiltonian. If we want to see the clash between these two Hamiltonians, then we need lots of paths going backwards and forwards. And of course, Feynman introduced the idea of um, sums over paths. So that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so what we need is lots of reversals to see this phenomena of you know, exposing the difference between these um, two Hamiltonians and to see the symmetry violation. So if we really want to see it, then we maybe we should, you know, throwing away dynamics, why not look about a um, situation where we have paths in time that go backwards and forwards? Because if we can have paths that go backwards and forwards in space, that's not a problem. So it should also happen in, sp uh, in time. So, so this is the idea. So just to recap, current theories are not symmetrical in time because they have one set of dynamics and uh, they, so they, they have one direct, uh, time direction. Um, uh, the universe can't decide in which direction and time to take. It's got no reference for that. Um, you can't just go in one direction of time. It's got to be symmetrical. So something is wrong there. Um, we've got two Hamiltonians. So we need a, if we have a, a, a theory, it should be incorporate two Hamiltonians and it should have two sets of dynamics. And the approach I'm going to take is to cast aside these dynamics and conservation laws that I've just said. I'm going to treat time and space on the same footing because that's a message we get from, that's a message we get from um, our special relativity. And um, to see this difference between the two Hamiltonians, we're going to look at lots of reversals, and, and uh, these reversals will have these two Hamiltonians. And the justification for doing this, for throwing away these fundamental assumptions, is that we would need to account for dynamics from this deeper cause, from T violation, and we need an experiment to verify it. So I'm not interested in just developing a theory that's just a nice way of looking at things. It's what uh, theorists often do. I really want to do something that maybe it would lead to an experiment. And we can ask nature, what's the answer? OK, so um, there's four principles that uh, I use to, to, to uh, build this model, this uh, formalism, that states should have the same construction in time and space. Okay, so we treat them on the same footing. So you can have particles and mass localized in space and time. The time evolution is directional. We've got two Hamiltonians. So one should be associated with this direction of time. So if we're moving in this direction, this is an evolution in the forwards direction, we use this evolution operator. If it's ev evolution in the opposite direction, it's that evolution operator, the different Hamiltonian. These other things are just mathematical inverses. They're not evolution. So there is this difference between evolution and just in moving along a timeline. Evolution is something physical in this, this idea, uh, which no one's thought about doing that before. Uh, thinking about these Hamiltonians are talking about evolution, which is something physical, as opposed to just being operators that take you across. And um, we need states, but to put in all these um, reversals in the, you know, to get reversals so we can see different Hamiltonians uh, operating, we use um, sums over paths. So the idea is to have many reversals. So here's a binary, oh, so he, here's the, the thing, these operators uh, to sum of forwards and backwards. So it's just a binary tree taken to the power of n. And uh, what that means is that we start at some point on the, the spatial axis, and then we go, we go into a superposition of one step forward and one step backwards. That's just one term. Um, the square would be four terms and, and so on. Okay. and we, we allow n to get very, very large, which means that the step size becomes very, very small. And eventually it goes below resolution. And this is the kind of thing that you do in uh, path integrals that Feynman introduced us to. And that will lead to a wave function. So this path going backwards and forwards on space gives us a wave function, which is a Gaussian, which is a you know, standard um, description of, of, of a part, particle that's localized in space. We do the same thing in time. We've thrown away conservation laws, so that doesn't matter. But now we've got our um, generator of translations in the forwards directions, in, in the backwards direction, so on, exactly the same. And we end up with being able to, this is a wave function for localizing a particle in time. 
That is when these two Hamiltonians are equal, it's localized in, in time. Uh, and then there's another part, because we actually end up with um, sequences which don't converge, we need to think about the resolution limit. Eventually this step size gets so small that we end up with lots of states that look exactly the same. So what we want to do is when the step size go, goes below a certain size, whoops, oh, where do I go? Goes below a certain size, um, like the Planck scale or something like that, we want to collect all those um, states that we get um, into a set and say they're all physically equivalent. They can all equally represent the state of this particle. Okay, so we have these quantum virtual parts representing the same localized state. If we do that in time, so now this is a, a quantum time, um, so there's, maybe it's a Planck time that we're looking at, it's just something small that we can't get to, it doesn't really matter what it, what it is. Um, when the step size is smaller than that, and the step size that's this delta t here is getting smaller as n gets bigger, uh, we collect them into a set, and uh, here's the set, and they're all, all the states that you develop from this um, expansion, all those states are equally able to represent this uh, particle localized in time. That's when the two Hamiltonians are equal, and that means that there's no T violation, it's just time symmetry. Okay, so in this theory, so just this is under the formalism, mass is not conserved and there's no dynamics when there's no T violation. But if we put on T, so that's the original thing that we wanted, there's no dynamics, that's, that's done it. Now if there's T violation, what's important in sorting out um, all these um, paths is that you find that there's many paths to the same place. And when you have T violation, you get phase differences and you get destructive interference. So there's a destructive interference here, but constructive in other places. And that comes in through um, a, uh, the commutator of the, uh, these two Hamiltonians. And then with this destructive interference, what we get is not one Gaussian, but two Gaussians that are separated. Um, uh, and so there's a sequence now in this set. Now we said that set, when there's no T violation, we said that that set should, every state in that set, should represent this particle, it should be equally likely to represent this particle. Now a T violation, all those um, states in the set are, are, um, form this sequence where it's, um, a, you know, bimodal, there's two Gau a superposition of two Gaussians, and those Gaussians are getting further and further apart. And it's unbounded, they just go out forever. In other words, it kind of like explodes, but it's really an unbounded um, sequence. Um, so, uh, so you find that these are the two Gaussians. You can write it as a superposition of two Gaussians. And so there's one Gaussian here, and this minus sign represents the other one. Now, if I said, um, does that particle exist? Like, it, like before, if I said over here where there's no T violation, if I can just go back. If I said, does the particle exist at T equals naught, you'd look over here and you'd say, well, all the states in this set um, there, this is the collection of them. Yes, they, they say that there's a high probability of finding it at, at the origin. If I ask, if, is the particle going to be found uh, over here on the time axis, you'd say, no, there's no probability. So mass is not conserved. But now look what happens with T violation. In this set, so here's the set of states. Each of them is made up of superposition of two Gaussians. If I ask, um, for a given time, so I'm looking over here somewhere, um, is there a state that represents the mass being at that time? Well, yes, there is. Um, there will, and it doesn't matter where you find it on the time axis, there will be. I've got this little problem about the symmetry that what, for the same, um, you know, for the minus value, like if I'm talking about a point on, with positive time, it, there's a 50% chance it'll be at minus as well, the same value at minus time. That's a little detail, but we can, wow, well, that's something to talk about. Um, presumably, if this is matter, then that's antimatter, and there's a symmetry there, and we can't really tell what we are. Um, I could go on and talk about that, but I really want to really focus on the idea that the mass is now in one of these states and every time. In other words, we can recover conservation of mass. Okay, so you can get that out of the theory of conservation of mass. Um, and uh, dynamics. If you just look at each of these states that you get here, and look at um, a difference between them, 
then you find you get the Schrodinger equation. The Hamiltonian is a little bit different because it's an average, because these Gaussians are, have an average of paths going forwards and backwards. They kind of average the forward Hamiltonian with a little bit of the backward Hamiltonian. So this phenomenological Hamiltonian is a little bit different from what you'd expect. Um, so that's a possibility for experiment to determine that, although there's certain problems associated with that I won't go into. Um, oh, where am I? I keep pressing the wrong button. Here. No? There. Um, so there's a Schrodinger equation associate, associated with each of the sets in sequence. In fact, it's an ordered set. You can show that this set is ordered. There's an order there. So you don't have to worry about entropy. It's, it's ordered automatically by these, well, I, it takes too much to describe it, but it's actually ordered by the time evolution, evolution, um, evolution operators. So it's an ordered set of states, and they get further apart and move along the time axis. You can uh, write down the Schrodinger equation, derive it from here, so that's actually derivable from it, and, and mass is conserved. So, um, so I've got now this, this idea. I mean, there's another branch over here, but if we just focus on the positive branch, we've got that one. Um, and I've accounted for the discarded assumptions of dynamics and mass conservation by a deeper course. So I've now recovered that. The other thing is that, um, is it verifiable by experiment? And, well, yes, in principle it is. Um, there's a number of ways. One is looking at the Hamiltonian, but another is just looking for um, variations in T violation. So, the peak of those Gaussians with T violation um, is inversely proportional to lambda, where lambda was, uh, I haven't, oh, lambda is this commutator, uh, the expectation value of the commutator. Now, if that commutator varies locally, then lambda will change and the peak will appear at a different place. Okay, so this is like a quantum time dilation, really controversial. Um, so the idea is that the peak the point where the, the peak in the Gaussian would be would depend upon how much local uh, T violation that's going on. If you look at a nuclear reactor, there's a lot of um, anti-neutrinos. It's from beta decay. And neutrinos are assumed to, um, normal neutrinos are assumed to uh, exhibit uh, CP violation from flavor mixing. And there are experiments to sh see that directly, but we assume that um, they exhibit CP violation, and if they exhibit CP violation, they should exhibit T violation. And there's an enormous amount of coming out of these, these are commercial reactors, so something like four gigawatts, that's a reasonable size, not, not too big, there are bigger ones. Um, they have about 10 megawatts of neutrinos and power coming out of them, falling off as one over R squared, and that means that the T violation um, is really high at the core and decays, well it in fact, it, because of the commutator you get the density goes to 1 over R squared, but the commutator brings it up to 1 over R4. So the gamma factor that I would predict from this uh, goes something like this. It's about 1, but it's got this other factor here that decays as 10 to the minus 4. And the sort of numbers, so I've looked at uh, nuclear reactors, and this lambda factor here, probably less than 10 to the minus 3. But we've got measurements of time, so looking at time dilation, that, you know, like Mosbauer spectroscopy goes down to 10 to the minus 11 and atomic clocks can take us down to 10 to the minus 16. So there's quite a few orders of magnitude uh, for checking this out. So this is where experiments should be. Now, all I said could completely be wrong. Uh, um, it's been nice doing this kind of work, and I have to be quite courageous to actually talk about it, because um, if you think about you know, throwing away conservation laws and thinking about time in this really remar remarkably different way, but the point is, it's not me that decides whether it's a good theory or not. It's nature. And if nature... Um, uh, if this is found, I mean, there's no reason to expect there's any time dilation near a nuclear reactor. Um, but if, na if nature is showing this, this, this would be quite remarkable. So this is where the effort should be, I think. And there's other things if this doesn't work. I mean, if we, if, if the t maybe we need an even bigger nuclear reactor than what we, can, what we currently have. I don't know. But maybe stars are the things to look at. Maybe there's some other effect out there. Anyway, so I'm just telling you about my work, which is really controversial. Um, I don't think everyone should be controversial because then it would be kind of madness. We wouldn't be able to talk to each other. But um, it's something to look out for, little irregularities that um, can really spice up your career and um, give you something to think about. Anyway, that, that's, that's, that's my talk. Thanks for listening.